Let me greet you this morning in the name and the love of the Lord. My name is Leslie, uh, and I'm one of the elders here. We just have this loose structure of, of elders, and um, we don't have any full-time staff. We're all volunteers, and we're happy that the Lord calls us together as a body to worship and to serve Him. And we certainly want you to feel the warmth of our welcome this morning. Uh, we have been doing a long sermon series all the way from Genesis. We started over a year and a half ago. And that's basically an outline there, all the way from the creation stage through the patriarchs, exodus, the conquest, the, uh, the judges, the United Kingdom, chaotic kingdom, captivity, the return, the gospel, and now um, the early church stage. So, we have identified in the New Testament uh, about 53 central chapters that essentially present the doctrine of who God is and why God is. And we feel this is important in building up the body that we have a firm grasp of the key theological principles that are behind Scripture. Uh, it's very easy to just go on topics and get lost in what is the popular flavor of the day at the world. But we feel that it's important to ground ourselves in the theology of the Scripture. And while it is God's love letter, while it is presented in narrative form, and we have stories, uh, and even then not in chronological sequence, that's part of the reason we've gone through that, to see how it lines up. But principally, the Word of God is a revelation of who He is, and why He is, and how He connects and interacts with us, and of how he wants to guide us in the living of our lives. So as we look at the 11th chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, join me in a word of prayer. Living and loving God, you have revealed yourself to us, your creation. You call us to be your people. You draw us close to your heart. For you have created us for a relationship with you and with one another. To live our lives in relationships of love. But we live in a fallen world, O oh Lord, and it presents us with many challenges. On a daily basis, we have to make choices in our lives. But your word is there to guide us. As you often said, he who has an ear, let him hear. So now we want to open the ears of our spirit to listen to your prompting and guiding and loving voice. Speak to each one of us in the different seasons of our lives, in the different circumstances. But always relevant. You are always here with us in the now. We open our lives to you. Speak to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul spent nearly two years in the city of Corinth. And this was during one of his missionary journeys, one of his many journeys. But he preached daily. And he ministered to those who would listen. During that time, there were many people who were converted to Christ, both the Jews and the Gentiles, and the Corinthian church was born. But Paul left Corinth to continue his work in other cities, leaving the church in peace and in perfect harmony. That's believe. But we know that Satan hates to see the church at peace and even more 
when everyone is in harmony. So almost immediately after Paul departs, heresies begin to invade the church, and false teachers arise amongst them, teaching bad doctrine. And this is one of the reasons why in the early days of BCF, as we pondered our constitution and our structure, we thought of having the elders, the position of elders. And the position of elders is not there so, so that the elders might feel exalted or that they are important people. The position of the elders primarily is to guard the doctrine of our flock, to ensure that false doctrine does not creep in. And today, there are so many doctrines out there. You just have to go on YouTube. And there are probably 50,000 sermons on a Sunday being uploaded from every end of the spectrum of theology. From the very, very hyper-conservative to the extremely liberal. So, what do we follow? Who do we listen to? And I believe that's one of the reasons God has structured the church. That the community of believers is a place where we meet and get together and we listen to the word, but we have to test it as well. We have to discern in our own spirits, is this something of the love of God? Does it reveal the fullness of who God is? I give you a rough guideline. In your journey of faith, has your picture of God become smaller? I can't do this. I can't do that. God will be angry with this. He will take away that and it gets smaller and smaller. Or is your picture of God getting bigger? Yes. I am no longer under the law, but I live according to the law. Because that is God's plan and His purpose. I am not judged by the law. I have been set free of that judgment by the blood of Jesus. But there is wisdom in God's guidance. And I adopt it. Because that is God's chosen way by which I can fulfill myself and discover who He is and who I am. And there is joy in seeking first the kingdom of God. And I believe if the doctrine is by and large close to the heart of God, our picture of God should be a growing one. Our love for God should be an increasing. Do you love God more today than when you first accepted Him? I would like to think so. I believe so. I know the grace of God, but I also come to embrace the holiness of God. I was just thinking of this phrase, I will never be sinless. But as I have walked with the Lord, I believe, or certainly like to believe, I sin less. I will never be sinless. But if we follow in the wisdom and the footsteps of the Lord, we are likely to sin less. So, this is why at BCF, every year, just before everyone breaks for summer, we charge you to go and think on the passage in Paul's first letter to Timothy chapter 3, the position of elders. If anyone aspires to be an elder, these are the things that you should see in that person's life. And we bring that before the congregation and we ask you to examine us according to those principles. And we have to be accountable, not only to the Word of God, but to each one of you. 
And I think through the year, I regularly try to remind you that if you feel there is doctrine, our preaching, certain precepts that we put forward that you're not comfortable with, come and clarify it. Come and ask us about it. And we should engage with you and clarify those things. Of course there will be differing opinions amongst us. There is no one position that everyone is comfortable with. But I think overall, it should be Christ-centered. And the love of God should be in our midst and manifest in our lives. And there's a simple test. that you look at the leaders, not necessarily the appointed ones, but those who just naturally have leadership roles in, in our congregation, do our lives manifest fruit? Because Jesus had a very simple guideline. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. So we don't live to impress people. We don't put up those precepts to say, look how great we are. But those are nevertheless the principles that God puts before us. And it's not just for the leaders to aspire to, it's for every one of us. It's for every one of us. The leaders should not be ahead of anyone. Jesus says, you should be the least. And so we want to encourage servant leadership. And if ever you sense pride coming in, then call it up. Because therein was the problem in Corinth. These false teachings and doctrines were surfacing, not only false doctrines and teaching, but practices. They were, they were practicing fornication. There was adultery. There was temple prostitution. And people kind of like, okay, I don't want to be the whistleblower, to use a contemporary term. I, I don't want to be the wet blanket. I don't want to be the spoil sport or the sour grapes, whatever you want to use to, to, for that role. And so they kept quiet and said, let's not rock the boat. So they didn't question these practices. And that is where Paul then begins to identify, if you look through the book of Corinthians, it is dealing with all of these problems that have arisen in the church, these false doctrines, these false practices. Uh, the Corinthians had allowed incest, that is, relationships within the family, sexual relationships within the family, and that is an abomination to the Lord. And they didn't call it out. They became so divided that they were taking one another to court, standing before a non-believing judge to decide which of them was right in their doctrine, instead of settling the matter amongst themselves. They were allowing adultery and fornication to continue rampant in the church, and no one was preaching against it for fear of upsetting the congregation. There was confusion about what the commitment of marriage was really all about. Because, as I mentioned last week, there were new converts to Christianity. And they said, well, my spouse is not a Christian, so how can I be devoted to Christ if I have a non-believing spouse? So I should get divorced. There was also a rather peculiar situation, which I have not seen the likes of in, in my ministry, where both husband and wife become Christians, and then they decide that they want to be wholly dedicated to the Lord, so much so that they should be celibate, and they would actually get divorced, so that they can be individually dedicated to God. So these were some of the issues that were standing in the Corinthian church. Last week, we looked at marriage, and I was so enthusiastic about pushing forth the institution of mar marriage and all its merits that I actually omitted 
what I had in my notes on divorce. So I thought I'd just go back and pick up on that a little. I want to reiterate that in God's plan, divorce should not be a consideration. And Jesus in Mark chapter 10, when he is asked, is it okay for a husband and wife to be divorced? Jesus' answer was, you know what it is said, it is because of the hardness of your heart that Moses has written in this permission or concession for divorce. Because of the hardness of your heart. But Jesus goes on to say, but this is not what it was in the beginning. That's why God made us male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is God's desire. And I share that as Christians, in an individual application, we should never consider divorce. I also shared that on the night before my wedding, I had time with my bride-to-be, or my wife-to-be, and I said, you know, it is not too late to pull out. <laughs> yes, it will be incredibly embarrassing. There will be a lot of guests. There will be a lot of disruption. But better you make sure of your choice now than we spend a lifetime torturing each other. I knew I was pretty safe, but I had to say it anyway. And I said, between now, this moment, I think it was about 10 something at night, I said, between now and tomorrow afternoon, you can change your mind, and I will not hold it against you. But the moment we kneel down at the altar, and we make our commitment to the Lord, then divorce will never come into my mind. I make you this pledge. No matter what happens in our lives, the only question is, how do we solve this problem? Because the vows we take before the holy, almighty, and eternal God is for better, for worse, for richer. No problem with that, mostly. And not so sure. For poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. Or in some vows, that until death do we part. And I believe there is a godly prudence to this advice. But, as I wanted to say, this applies to us. We should apply it to ourselves and not use it as an imposition on others. I'm on tricky ground now, I know, but I think it, I feel I need to raise it. Because surely, in a community, there will be those who are divorced or going through divorce, or contemplating divorce. Life is complex. There's a whole variety of issues and relationships. No two relationships are the same. No two marriages are the same. Right? But I want to say clearly, I think this charge that we should never consider divorce is something we apply to ourselves. Can we be a little bit schizophrenic? And as we apply it to ourselves, we do not impose it on other people. We do not then shun someone who is divorced and say, you are a sinner and we can't have anything to do with you. I don't believe that's the way it's meant to be applied. I know there is a fear that if we say, oh, then it's okay, we, we welcome or we, we have a marriage here between one or two people who are divorced, then that's license. Do you really think so? 
I believe that if the fundamental unit of the family is whole, and we present godly marriages to our children, and we teach them the proper principles, they won't see it licensed. And we can use that situation to explain to them the complexities of compassion. I don't think just because I conduct a wedding between one or two divorced people, that then everybody is going to run out and say, oh, it's okay to get divorced. Divorce is one of, the, I think, the most difficult human experiences. There is no such thing as an easy divorce. And I don't think people contemplate it too lightly. But I believe that the community and the kingdom of God fundamentally is a kingdom of redemption. It is a kingdom of redemption. And I'm so sad when I see communities of people who well-meaning, I have no doubt about the good intentions that they have, just inflict more pain upon people who are already suffering enough. Jesus approached the woman at the well. Remember the Samaritan woman? And she was what? In a relationship of adultery. She had had many husbands before her. He forgave her and many people pick up at that point and say, yeah, but he told her go and sin no more. Hang on a minute. Do you think that Jesus, all-knowing Jesus, would for one moment think that she would never sin again? Who here can claim that? We come to communion today, and then I go say, sin, go and sin no more. So do you think Jesus didn't know? Far from it. That's the whole reason Jesus came. Because we continue to sin. Like I say, I hope I sin less. But I will never be sinless this side of glory. So I am grateful that we have before us the constant opportunity to check ourselves, to be guided by the Word and to repent and to confess and receive the cleansing of His blood on a continual basis so that I can walk in proximity of His Holy Presence. So should we not, as the people of God, also reflect that compassion? I have done many weddings in my ministry. When I say 200 people say he's making it up. Well, I got the orders of service in folders. That's because in the early years in Singapore, People are getting married all over the place. It's like we do two weddings on a weekend. That would be average. But quite a few of those unions have come apart. And they sort me out again. Even here in Thailand, they called me up. Remember, Pastor, you did our wedding 30 years ago. We're having problems now. Life is complex, isn't it? There are no easy answers. We as a community should always try to encourage reconciliation. But sometimes that's just not possible. And in all of those instances, I, I think twice, only twice have I actually told the person to go ahead with it. In one case, it was clearly one of abuse, physical abuse. 
documented evidence of broken bones, bruised face, etc. And she had persisted for 35 years in an abusive relationship, hospitalized many, many times. And what was holding her? It's because all the Christians around her said, no, no, pray for him, God will change him. You should not divorce him. And when she came to me, I prayed about it and I said, pursue the divorce. And I helped her. I got her a lawyer. I put her in touch with the judge to guide her through the proceedings. <coughs> she was in fear for her safety from this abusive character. And we completed the report. She was still unsure. She says, I don't know. What if God is not happy? <coughs> and it came down to me having to say to her, if you're really that unsure, put it on my account. Let me answer for it as your pastor. I'll take responsibility for it. And I'm prepared. I am prepared. It was not empty words. I'm prepared to pay a price if there is one. I'm prepared to stand before the throne and say, yes, I did this. Lord. I told her to go ahead against your will. Do with me according to your righteous and holy judgment. Because I feel strongly, and I'm prepared to pay for it, there will be a call to be compassionate. And that is different from giving license. I felt in my heart, is this God of love who come to the glory of heaven, not something to be grasped? Is this God unhappy that she should get divorced? That God is happier seeing her getting beat up and living in fear for 35 years? I can't conceive that. I really, really can't. So, this is the issue that was before the Corinthian church. And it's before us. And there may well be a day that comes that we are confronted with this in, in real life situation. I think we need to hold the two together, to be in balance. That we worship a holy God who has a standard. But that holiness is not a standard we can meet. But we fulfill it in submission to the only one who could pay the full price. And thereafter, embracing receiving and understanding that grace, we nurture our community. We help those who are struggling. We are not the ones to judge and condemn. Who dares to throw the first stone? So there was a whole lot a whole range of practices in the Corinthian church that Paul was trying to write. I encourage you to read through uh, the 11th chapter of Corinthians. But I would like to look, as is the title of today's sermon, The Lord's Supper. We dealt with that early on in the Gospel when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. The issue here with the Lord's Supper was Paul was admonishing the Corinthian Christians because when they came together in what they called the Lord's Supper, it was actually far from that. 
they were coming together. Okay, this is a weak analogy, but like after this service, we, we have lunch together, right? Everyone is invited for lunch if I end early enough. Because uh, Steve says you guys have to leave by 12. So we have lunch together and we are the Lord's people. But would it be appropriate to say that we celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Paul clearly marks that there is a difference. There is a difference. Because they were coming together probably on a daily basis. And Jesus did say, do this as often as you eat and drink in remembrance of me. It's only now through church tradition that most churches not all, most churches observe communion once a month. I do know of fellowships that have it every service. But Paul was saying they were coming together and probably the more wealthy amongst them coming earlier because they didn't have to work. And they would come in early and they would have their own cliques and gatherings and then they would eat up all the food. And by the time those who had to work late or whatever came, there was no more food and they would go hungry. So Paul was distraught by this and he admonishes them. He says, you expect praise from me? Far from it. You dishonor the Lord. Suffice to say, the Lord's Supper or what we call Holy Communion is a sacred institution of the church. It is a time for us to be in reflection of our lives, our conduct, our attitudes, and to seek the Lord. To be in a spirit of self-examination. It's not party time. Right? And then it, when we come together, we give reverence to the Lord. And we remember specifically and centrally His body broken and His blood shed for our forgiveness. Now, this portion is what I'd like to uh, address, if I may, where Paul says something rather disturbing. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Next verse. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep or passed away. This is a rather scary verse and I think it needs to be addressed in a balanced fashion. Right? Because I do know of certain congregations or a strand of theology who have applied this verse and then said, there's someone who is sick in hospital. Well, possibly you, you haven't been serious about repenting of your sin. And you've been taking communion frivolously. And that is why you are ill. So you need to confess. And the person confesses to the best of their knowledge. And then healing doesn't come. And these people then come at them again and say, well, there must be something hidden in your life. And that is why you are still sick, because if you confess of your sin, then God should forgive you and heal you. I have sat with people who've said, Pastor, I've confessed everything that I know of. I've even gone and confessed stuff I haven't done. Seriously, I've even confessed stuff that I haven't done, just to be safe. Surely this is not what God, Paul was talking about. 
We live in a fallen world and we are in a fallen state. There is disease and illness. There is miraculous healing, but I think, in my observation, it's in the minority of the time. Because as the song says, something's going to get you. This body is going to decay. Even Lazarus, who received the 10 on the scale of 1 to 10 of miracles and healing, he got raised from the dead. He died again. Right? Something else got him. Yes, it is sin, original sin, that it results in our illness and our death and this is. But we can't make a simple equation. That every time a person gets sick, you say it's because of your sin, it's because of uncontested sin. But Paul does clearly say, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. What is he trying to say there? I believe essentially that, as I've said, this is God's instruction manual to life. And if we don't follow the instruction manual, it is no wonder we end up with faulty appliance. <coughs> right? So, when that happens, it is what I call choice and consequence. You make poor choices in your life, you, you're going to reap that at some point. Okay? And that is the judgment. Whereas I believe if we come into the presence of God and we take the time to reflect on an occasion like Holy Communion, it makes us think about our lives. I believe the spirit of truth can convict us of what is erroneous in our lives and in our practice. And if we see what I call the God's prudence and we apply it to our lives, then we are spared those consequences, right? Now, we must not get caught up in superstition. It's a fine line here with superstition, right? Oh, you know, if, if something bad befalls us, it's because we haven't done something for God. I think that will lead us to live in fear all the time. Right? And something goes wrong, what did I forget? What have I not done? But that is such a transactional relationship with God. I just don't see that in his revelation of who he is. I, I see the shepherd who leaves the 99 behind and goes and finds the one lost sheep. I, if it was transactional, he said, I got 99, I can afford to lose one. He was pretty dumb sheep anyway. And that's not saying much about sheep. Right? Why, why does he look after the lost coin? Because God is all compassion. And He doesn't want that any sheep or coin or anything should be lost. Surely that is not the expression of a transactional God. Right? I don't see how people can look at it and then come up with all of these equations that are purely transactional. But as I said, we shouldn't lapse into superstition. So how is it that Paul does seem to say that because you have not taken communion seriously, that you now have, you are weak, you are sick, and some of you have even died. Now, this is my interpretation, and I'm open to dialogue with you, if you have a different point of view. I believe strongly that we are body, mind, and spirit. And because we are made in the image of God, and God is triune. And so are we. But my observation 
in our scientific and materialistic world, we have largely neglected what I would, for the want of a better term, call our spirit self. Right? The spirit part of our being. We know we have to take care of our bodies. Now there's all this material about diet and, and uh, all kinds of programs to, to, to take care of your body. We, we are aware of that. And then there's a whole lot of other places you can go to take care of your mind. Go for long walks, go sit by pools, go and do a whole lot of things. But I don't see a whole lot out there about nurturing the spirit. And I'm not just talking about meditation. Because the Word of God seems to say that the nurturing of our spirit is by feeding on His Word. The blessed man in Psalm 1 is the man who is like a tree planted by the water, who meditates on the Word of God both day and night. The Word of God is the Word of life. It is the word of the power unto transformation, is it not? And that when we ponder on the word of God, it nourishes our spirit. And as God is doing that renewing of our spirit, what David cried out, create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit, O oh God. I believe that that then affects our body and our mind. So Paul, for me, is saying here, your spirit is in a wrong place. Your spirit is not understanding God's heart and how He wants you to live and practice as community. And because you have neglected your spirit in the light of God's holiness, then it is bearing consequence in your body and in your mind. And we know it is linked. It's very obvious, we know, that if we're physically unwell, then it starts to affect our mind, right? If you have a long, long illness for several months or years, then you, you start to get depressed. It affects your mind. We know that if people are mentally unwell, then it starts to manifest physically. It starts to affect their body, right? If you're under stress, your mind is under stress, there's a lot of work pressure, there's a lot of troubling circumstances around you, what happens? You start to manifest physically. Things start to go wrong. Your, your diet, your digestion, your sleep, whatever. So, it's very clear that these things are linked. Right? So why do we then separate the spirit? And why is it so hard for us to understand that if our spirits are not being nurtured and being guarded to, to keep health, then it's going to manifest mentally and physically. And I believe this is what is happening here in the Corinthian church. Because they were not mindful of the place of their spirit, the attitude of their spirit, the nurture of their spirit, it was then resulting in physical and, and other issues. Okay? So, the encouragement here is that the Word of God challenges us to seek Him all the time. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, His holiness, His presence. These other things will fall into place. So, I try to always live by this. Don't think of just the principles of God, because then we become slaves to the law. With due uh, respect to Rick Warren, don't be overly preoccupied with the purposes of God. Because in today's kind of uh, priority notebook uh, generation, we were always purpose driven and what do I need to do and when do I get it done and how do I do it? And we get 
so caught up with that. I would like to encourage you to practice the presence of God. Because it seems to me that all of the means of access to God are be still. Not go and do and know that I am God. Go and be busy and I will reveal myself. It is be still and know that I am God. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And I leave you with that, that we want to seek the presence of God and to be patient. And we don't try to get ahead of God. And I think I see this so often in the Christian world. People just getting ahead of God. When on one of my trips to Israel, we were told that that morning we were going to watch the eagles soar. So we had to go really early. And we climb up the mountainside overlooking this valley and all the cliff faces. And we got into a high a little crack there, and just on the front of the hide, you had all these silhouettes of the different eagles. So you waited there to try and spot the different types of eagles that would be soaring. When we all got into position and we were all excited and everybody was looking and people were kind of saying, can you see anything? And then the guide said, oh, uh, I'm sorry. Because we got here a bit too early. You Singaporeans are so punctual, we actually got here early. Usually the groups are late in the morning, so. We're a bit early. But what we have to do is just to wait a while because the air hasn't heated up enough. So the eagles won't come out. And then it came to me why this verse is there in Isaiah. He must have been sitting on the mountainside because as you know, as the sun rises and the air heats up, it creates thermals. And it's only when the air is hot enough that the eagles will venture forth. And the eagles don't fly, they soar. They rise on the thermals. And that's such a beautiful analogy for us if we wait upon the Lord. And we move in time with the Spirit. And then we will soar with wings like eagles. We will run and not be weary. We will walk and we will not faint. And we won't have these things besetting us if we dwell in the presence of the Almighty. Let us pray. Almighty God, we rejoice that you are a loving God a God of compassion. But we acknowledge you this morning that you are also a holy God. And we fear that holiness. We give you reverence. We stand in awe of you. We recognize that we are a people of unclean lips. And we live in unclean communities. But your property is always to have mercy. And we thank you and we receive this mercy afresh, each one of us. As we have examined our hearts, renew in us a right spirit, O oh God. Increase the desire to dwell in your presence, to be like trees planted by your life-giving streams. Help us as we journey to mount up with wings like eagles. Take away the weariness and the burden of our efforts. Touch us afresh, for we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.